Today, FDA approvals in multiple myeloma and immune thrombocytopenia, applications accepted in multiple myeloma and for a new dosing schedule for a PD-1 inhibitor, and a European approval in cutaneous squamous cell carcinoma. Welcome to Enclave News Network, I'm Gina Columbus. The FDA has granted an accelerated approval to sell an XOR, known by the trade name Expovio, for use in combination with dexamethasone for the treatment of adult patients with relapsed refractory multiple myeloma who have received at least four prior therapies and whose disease is refractory to at least two proteasome inhibitors, two or more immunomodulatory agents, and a CD38-targeted monoclonal antibody. The approval is based on data from a pre-specified subgroup analysis of Part 2 of the single-arm Phase 2 STORM trial, in which the overall response rate was 25.3% as assessed by an independent review committee in 83 patients whose disease was refractory to bortezomib, carfilzomib, lenalidomide, pomalidomide, and daratumumab. Moreover, the stringent complete response rate was 1%, the very good partial response rate was 5%, and the partial response rate was 19%. The approval is contingent on the results of a confirmatory trial, which is the Phase 3 Boston study. This trial is evaluating the addition of selenexor to bortezomib and low-dose dexamethasone versus bortezomib and low-dose dexamethasone alone in patients with relapsed refractory multiple myeloma who have received one to three prior regimens. The approval follows a February 2018 FDA Oncologic Drugs Advisory Committee hearing in which the committee voted 8-5 to five against approving the new drug application for Selenexor as it recommended the agency to delay a decision on the drug until the Boston data became available. Additionally, the European Medicines Agency is also reviewing a marketing authorization application for Selenexor for this indication. In chronic immune thrombocytopenia, the FDA has approved a supplemental new drug application to expand the use of avitrombopag to include the treatment of adult patients who have had an insufficient response to prior therapy. The approval of the oral thrombopoietin receptor agonist was mainly based on results from a phase three trial, which showed that avitrombopag led to a platelet count of more than 50,000 per mu liter after eight days of therapy in the majority of patients with chronic ITP. It was also superior to placebo in maintaining platelet counts in the target range during a six-month period. The decision to approve avitrimopag was also supported by two phase two clinical trials and two phase three studies in thrombocytopenia in patients with chronic liver disease. Safety data were considered across the 24 studies in the avitrimopag clinical development program. Avitrombopag was initially approved by the FDA in May 2018 as a treatment for thrombocytopenia in adults with CLD who are scheduled to undergo a medical or dental procedure. The FDA has accepted a biologics license application for isatuximab for the treatment of patients with relapsed refractory multiple myeloma. The application is based on the Phase 3 Icaria MM trial in which adding isatuximab to pomalidomide and low-dose dexamethasone led to a greater than 40% reduction in the risk of disease progression or death versus pomalidomide and dexamethasone alone in patients with relapsed refractory disease. Results showed that in a median follow-up of 11.6 months, the median progression-free survival per independent review was 11.53 months with the isatuximab regimen compared with 6.47 months with PD alone. Overall survival data were immature at the time of the analysis. However, there was a trend toward a survival benefit for the isatuximab arm. The median OS was not reached in either arm, and the one-year OS rate was 72% with the isatuximab triplet versus 63% with PD alone. The FDA is scheduled to make a decision on the BLA by April 30th, 2020. The FDA has accepted six supplemental biologics license applications for review to update the dosing schedule for pembrolizumab to include an every six weeks option at 400 milligrams over 30 minute infusions. The new dosage would be applicable to the PD-1 inhibitors following indications, melanoma, Merkel cell carcinoma, gastric cancer, hepatocellular carcinoma, classical Hodgkin lymphoma, and primary mediastinal large B-cell lymphoma. If approved, the updated dosing schedule would be available in addition to the standard 200 milligram every three week schedule, which is also administered over a 30 minute infusion. The FDA must make a decision on the application by February 18, 2020. In March 2019, the European Commission approved the 400 milligram every six week dosing schedule in all of pembrolizumab's single agent indications, which also include non-small cell lung cancer, head and neck squamous cell carcinoma, urothelial carcinoma, microsatellite instability high or mismatch repair deficient solid tumors, and cervical cancer. 
Results of a study evaluating the extended dosing schedule show that the two dosing regimens are expected to have a similar benefit risk profile, suggesting that physicians could have the flexibility to dose at a frequency that is personalized toward patients' needs and or personal preferences. In cutaneous squamous cell carcinoma, the European Commission approved semiplumab for the treatment of adult patients with metastatic or locally advanced disease who are not candidates for curative surgery or curative radiation. The approval is primarily based on data from the Phase II Empower CSCC1 trial, which assessed single-agent semiplumab in 78 patients with locally advanced CSCC and 59 patients with metastatic disease. At a median follow-up of nine months, results show that the objective response rate was 44% in the locally advanced group. In the metastatic group, the ORR was 49% at a median follow-up of 17 months. Semiplam was granted conditional marketing authorization, therefore continued approval is contingent on additional information being supplied to the European Medicines Agency that support the drug's benefit-risk profile. To comply, the manufacturers Regeneron and Sanofi are adding a new patient group to Empower CSCC1 to obtain additional data. The FDA approved semiflamab for patients with CSCC in September 2018. This week, we sat down with Dr. Anthony Mado of Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center to discuss recent breakthroughs in the treatment of patients with refractory CLL. At the ASCO annual meeting 2019, we learned a lot about CLL, in particular how to manage challenging patients. Issues that were dealt with included intolerance to novel agents, how to treat patients with high-risk disease, managing patients with a chemotherapy-free approach in the frontline and relapse refractory setting, so really moving the ball forward in terms of addressing questions that are important to patients with CLL. Before the advent of the novel agents or the targeted therapies, treatment for CLL was largely a one-size-fits-all for patients. Patients received chemoimmunotherapy or chemotherapy combinations with not really a lot of choice with the exception of how intensive therapies were. Now that we have several agents available in the relapse refractory setting, we are truly entering an era where medicine can be personalized for patients. Factors that we think about include patient age, their performance status, their medical comorbidities, and also their molecular and genetic profiles. All of that taken together can help us to select an agent which is quite efficacious, but also minimizes toxicity for patients. Some of the more difficult patient populations to treat with CLL include those that are intolerant to kinase inhibitor therapy. There was an abstract presented here at the ASCO meeting looking at the use of acalabrutinib in patients who were intolerant to ibrutinib. The drug seemed to be active and well tolerated. We're expecting longer term follow up data to really help flesh out the toxicities in that particular patient population, but it is a potential option for patients who discontinue one drug to switch to another within the same class. Other areas that we face difficulty include, for example, treating patients who are older with CLL, particularly in the frontline setting. There was an abstract presented at this meeting looking at the combination of obinutuzumab with venetoclax as a first therapy. This is a CLL-14 trial which randomized patients to obinutuzumab venetoclax versus obinutuzumab plus chlorambucil. The trial results were overwhelmingly positive for the experimental arm in terms of response rate depth of response, duration of response, progression-free survival, but also more importantly, this represents a step forward in terms of targeted therapies because it's the first therapy that will be approved for CLL with a fixed duration in the frontline setting that's chemotherapy-free. The study design was unique in that it took the combination of venetoclax plus obinutuzumab. Some aspects of it, which I wanted to highlight, were that first of all, the obinutuzumab was given before the venetoclax which should theoretically debulk patients so that they are mostly managed in the outpatient setting. One of the challenges with venetoclax is that patients who are high risk for TLS or tumor lysis syndrome need to be hospitalized for at least the first two dose ramp ups. The study showed us that by giving obinutuzumab first, there could be a marked reduction in the lymphocytosis associated with CLL. Unfortunately, one of the limitations was that we didn't have CT scans performed immediately prior to venetoclax. So it, we can't say with certainty how the risk status changed for patients, but the results are encouraging um, based on the obinutuzumab phase alone to suggest that most patients will be treated in the outpatient setting rather than required hospitalization in the setting of high risk disease. A another interesting aspect of the study design, again, is the fixed duration of the combination. So the drugs are given together for a total of 12 months of therapy, obinutuzumab lead-in followed by venetoclax in combination where all patients are stopping at that particular point in time. 
Uh, the comparator is obinutuzumab plus chlorambucil, which is known as the CLL11 regimen. One of the, I think, really smart things that were done in the design here was that the chemotherapy component of CLL11 was extended from six months, which it is the way that it was originally designed, to 12 months to give us a more fair comparison. 12 months of oral venetoclax, 12 months of chlorambucil, six months of obinutuzumab, six months of obinutuzumab. So it helps us to really understand when we're giving therapy for the exact same length of time what the differences are between those combinations. I think it was really, really important that they did that. That's all for today. Thank you for watching Enclave News Network. I'm Gina Columbus.